Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, I hope the beer is still flowing. This is E2 EVC after all. Um, welcome uh, to this session, Azure Firewall for DevSecOps. Uh, my name is Aidan Finn, and I'm coming to you from the Midlands of Ireland, uh, about 40 kilometers west of Dublin. Um, so this session, I'm going to talk to you about Azure Firewall, um, which I've been working a good bit with uh, over the last year in a DevSecOps scenario. And I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Um, good news here is I don't have much in the way of slides. Um, deliberately keeping the slides down uh, and focus more on the actual demo side of things. So I'm a Microsoft Valuable Professional or an MVP. And this is the end of my 12th year. Um, hopefully there will be a 13th starting next month. Uh, I'm an Azure MVP, but before that I've been a Hyper-V and a System Center Configuration Manager MVP. I'm the owner of a company called Cloud Mechanics. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And Alex was mentioning uh, the Norwegian flag that's sitting behind me. Um, I work for a company called Innofactor in Norway. I work for the Oslo office and I'm a principal consultant there. I work with Azure infrastructure, focusing on building DevSecOps scenarios. I suppose if we were to call it properly, it would be DevSec governance ops scenarios. Um, so building our virtual data center product along with uh, some of my colleagues and deploying that to give customers security, confidence, governance from the start of their Azure journey. Um, I've been working in IT since 96, uh, so it's way too long. Um, I'm getting to the point now where I'm working with colleagues who were born after Active Directory. Um, that's depressing and scary. Um, I work with lots and lots of stuff, and you can find me on aidenfin.com. I mentioned Cloud Mechanics, um, that's cloudmechanics.com. Um, today you're getting a little sneak, little teeny tiny sneak peek of a new course I've written um, that I'm going to be delivering next Friday um, for a sponsor, and I will be doing myself with my Cloud Mechanics company next uh, month, so on July 30th. Um, it's a one-day course, it's online only, so no travel restrictions. No, near, no need to wear a mask or anything. Um, and it covers network security um, from the IaaS and PaaS perspective, because people forget that network security also impacts platform as a service. So things like micro segmentation, firewall design, but there's a layer four, layer seven network design. And you'll find things like front door, private link, or end, private endpoint, Azure Sentinel, all that good stuff in that class. So you can learn more about that on cloudmechanics.com or on tiny URL, July 30, 2020. Right, let's talk about Azure Firewall and firewalls. Do you need a firewall? You know, Azure comes with this thing called Network Security Group and Azure Secure and all that good stuff. Do I need a firewall? The answer is, yeah, you do. Um, if you're a small business, putting in a firewall appliance could be expensive, so maybe you go with a Network Security Group and that's enough for you. But you know what, if you're doing SaaS, if you're a mid-sized business or bigger, government, large enterprise, you need to implement firewalls. Think about it. Would you build a physical data center without a firewall in the network core? I hope not. So you should be doing the same in your Azure deployment. You should be isolating your Azure deployment from your on-premises environment, from the internet, and from other Azure footprints you may have around the world because Azure is global. You could have Azure footprints all around the place. This will add some complexity in here, um, absolutely. And that's you know a big part of what I teach is how to deal with that complexity. The firewall itself is, if you do it right, is really, really simple. It's how to get traffic to that firewall is the challenge. Um, it's not just a, an IaaS thing, as I said, it's very important now for the platform. For people who are worried about compliance, for people who are worried about true security and controlling every flow, and understanding that there's more to network flows than just the HTTP, HTTPS traffic that might be going in and out of their API management or whatever it is. There are other things happening. There are integrations between services. There are communications to outside integrations. And there's communications with the on-premises client or the internet client. All of this must be secured and filtered and logged. You need your firewall to do that. Um, so keep that in mind. The primary function of your firewall is to allow or deny traffic. That's its primary function. But if you're building a scalable environment, whether you're doing SaaS or you're midsize or larger, you're probably in Azure going to deploy a hub and spoke virtual network architecture. Think of the hubs being your network core in your data center. And your spokes are the virtual networks or VLANs that you would deploy around your data center. They all connect back into the hub and they route through that firewall 
to get to each other and to the outside world. And the outside world must come through that firewall to get to those spokes. And your service is running on those spokes. That central firewall is ideally going to be maintained by central IT, by your IT security people. So all your north-south flows, all your east-west flows are going to go through there. And you may delegate out other forms of security in terms of micro-segmentation out to the service. So the developers, the operators can do certain things there, but they will have to go through that central point. So the right people are going to be doing security, they're going to be doing the governance, they're going to be doing the compliance stuff. You're not just outsourcing network security to a developer, which let's face it, that's not going to end well. Um, and we see plenty of examples of that out there in the world. The Azure Firewall itself is actually, architecture-wise, it's relatively simple. It deploys into a single subnet that has to be called Azure Firewall Subnet. Um, it has a single private IP address. No need to do multiple subnets for the Azure Firewall. Um, if you understand software-defined networking and how virtual machine performance works, um, all these architectures that you see, some of the third parties pushing at you, your checkpoints and all these other guys, where you have multiple subnets and there are multiple mix for all these different roles, makes no difference. In fact, it just overcomplicates. It offers no extra security. It offers no extra performance. All it does is complicate. The Azure Firewall keeps it simple. One of the beauties of the firewall, keep it simple. You can have up to 100 public IP addresses. It'll have at least one. It can have up to 100. And that's for multiple reasons. It can be for uh, scaling out your DNAT, so that's translating inbound uh, traffic for legacy services. Uh, so your FTPs, et cetera, uh, coming into your firewall and looking to get to a private IP address. So if you have multiple FTP servers, you have to have multiple public IP addresses. Also, there's a strange thing here with the load balancer in Azure. Um, so no matter what type of firewall you use, if you scale it out for high availability or for performance, um, you are going to have a standard load balancer sitting in front of it with a public IP address. Your outbound connections are going to be snatted through that uh, public IP address to the internet. And that load balancer with a single public IP address is only going to have a certain capacity for ongoing conversations or snatted communications through that uh, load balancer. And the way we scale that out is applying multiple public IP addresses. So in the case of the Azure Firewall, I'd say to you if, is if you think you're in that scenario where you may need more than one public IP address, deploy them from an IP prefix. So deploy a slash 25 IP prefix, which will give you 128 IP addresses and allow you to supply up to 100 sequential IP addresses. And that's the trick, sequential IP addresses. Um, that means doing firewall rules on the other end of the communications will be easier. You won't have to list out individual IP addresses. You'll just have to put down a CID or block. Um, so that'll make life a lot easier. Under the covers, that's where all the complexity is. And this is one of the benefits of using the platform. If you were deploying this using you know, third-party firewalls, you would have to engineer all this stuff. But when you use the Azure Firewall, you don't have to. It's just done for you. Um, you deploy the firewall and under the covers, it has lots of virtual machines. That's what's running under it. Uh, your third-party firewall is deploying lots of typically DV2 virtual machines. Um, and the Azure Firewall does something similar. Um, all you see is the firewall, one or more public IP addresses, a single private IP address, and that's it. Um, you can configure the Azure Firewall um, in terms of high availability. So you can tell it to go with its default mode, which is where it uses availability sets in a single data center. Um, or if your region that you're deploying into supports availability zones, you can make the Azure Firewall zonal. So you can deploy it across multiple zones. And so if you're doing that in JSON, it's a simple array listing the zone numbers, so one, two, and three. Um, and that makes the firewall active, active, active across each of those zones. Um, when your throughput increases, it will automatically scale out the number of virtual machines and your firewall will give you up to 30 gigabits per second of throughput without a support call, um, which is quite a lot of throughput. The more you push through, the more instances it will deploy under the covers, the higher your cost will be for that firewall. So it's true pay as you go. The alternative with your third parties is you either hit a bottleneck or you go out and deploy virtual machines, nice slow process, by licensing, all that good stuff. You can't just go and buy a license. Um, you buy a license for probably a certain number of years with support, or you can go with the more expensive option of getting that license through the marketplace. Um, the Azure Firewall really is kind of cool. It's, you know, 
use it and go. Um, there's no real administration afterwards, it's just configure your rules. Um, one of the big strengths of the Azure Firewall is it's pure JSON. So it is a true appliance. You don't have to manage the appliance, you don't have to upgrade software, you don't have to patch it, you don't have to reboot it. Um, you have none of this magical stuff where you have to deploy service buses to make configurations consistent across all the nodes. It's literally deploy it and either manage it through the Azure portal, which is one way of doing it, that's the default way, or manage it, as I'm going to talk about, using JSON. The entire configuration is JSON. So the resource you're deploying, JSON. The feature configuration, JSON. And here's the bit that's really interesting, the rules. This is where most of your operations will be, your security operations will be for that Azure Firewall, is configuring your rules. And DevSecOps is all about making security a part of your deployment process. It shouldn't be an afterthought. It should be develop, secure it, operate it. And that's what DevSecOps is all about. So with the Azure Firewall, we can take that sec part and we build it into the DevOps scenario. So the rules, which are written in JSON, they can be managed through GitHub or DevOps or whatever your favorite solution is. So now we get into this same sort of scenario with infrastructure as code as you can do for the rest of your services. So we can go with hands-off management. Deploy the Azure Firewall into a hub. That hub is sitting in a subscription. It's a production subscription that's read-only. You might have some break glass accounts for it, but your day-to-day -day activity, you shouldn't ever be touching it. You might go in to have a look at it, but you should not be making any changes to it. Instead, you're going to store the configuration in a master branch in the likes of GitHub or DevOps. And any changes you want to do, you'll do by making a, a copy of that master repository. We call those a branch. And you can do that directly in your tools like DevOps, or you can use tools like uh, Visual Studio Code or VS Code, it's a free version of Visual Studio, to make a branch, make the changes to the rules, and then sync them back up to GitHub or DevOps. Then you do a pull request. That's a funny name, a pull request. As to me, it sounds like a push request, but it, you think about this from the perspective of the person who owns the master, you're asking them to pull your branch into the master and merge your changes into that master. GitHub and DevOps will track those individual changes. Your alterations are then merged in. So someone reviews those changes and says yes or no. Now if they say yes, those alterations are implemented and forced into the master. Now something called a pipeline in DevOps or an action in GitHub will implement your uh, re-implement that master branch out to that production subscription. And it will do that using a credential known as a service principal name or an SPN. Now, because D GitHub and DevOps are, tr are tracking those changes to the master branch, if that change you pushed out and that got approved broke something, it could be easily undone. We have an automatic rollback. So we can go into DevOps and we can say, actually, you know what? That most recent iteration of the master, I want to actually go back in time to an older version and I want to deploy that instead. And as soon as you commit that, the pipeline will kick in again and redeploy the firewall and its configuration back out. The other cool thing about the Azure Firewall and I don't mention here in the slides is because it's pure JSON, you can actually back up that entire firewall. So if you lose the firewall or the configuration gets screwed up, you can restore it. And the backup is a JSON template. And the restore is re-implement the JSON template. And you can find how to do that on my site on aidenfin.com. If you just do a Google for backup Azure Firewall, you'll probably find it. Right, that's enough of the slides. Let's go in and actually look at this stuff. So we'll get out of PowerPoint and we will go to the Azure portal. And by the way, if you want to learn a bit more about DevSecOps, um, Red Hat actually has an interesting short page and a YouTube video to talk about what DevSecOps is. Um, so here I am in the Azure portal and I've deployed the Azure firewall in two different ways. And I want to show you that and I'm going to show you different ways of managing it as well. I'm going to show you two ways through the Azure portal and then I'm going to show you one way through DevOps where we can do that DevSecOps thing. So the normal or the legacy method of deploying the Azure firewall, the one that people might be familiar with, is where we deploy the firewall to a virtual network. So I've created a virtual network. This is my hub virtual network. And in that virtual network, I have a couple of subnets. I have a gateway subnet, 
where I'm running a virtual network gateway or two virtual network gateways, depending on the scenario, one for site-to-site VPN and point-to-site VPN, one for express route. Um, and I can automatically fail over from my express route to site-to-site VPN, or I can do one or the other. And I've got an Azure Firewall subnet, and this is where my Azure Firewall is going to reside. If I go back to my resource group, I can see that, yeah, I've got my firewall. It's got a public IP address, and I've got root tables associated with my subnets. So one of my gateway subnet forcing traffic coming across express route or site-to-site -site VPN to go through the firewall to get to the individual spokes. And I'll have to uh, implement a CIDR for every one of my spokes in that gateway subnet to force that traffic through the firewall. And if you want to know more about that, again, go onto my site where I've blogged about that sort of stuff as well. I've implemented a root table for my firewall as well, because I may want to have multiple hub and spoke architectures around the world. So maybe have one in East US, one in West Europe, one in Norway East, and I want them to communicate with each other and to force that traffic to go through the firewalls and the source and the destination. I have to implement a root table here to force that traffic. And again, go onto agentvin.com and you'll learn more about that. I've got a workspace for log analytics. So my firewall is going to be generating log data. It's going to log every single packet that's been allowed or denied. It's also going to log about stuff uh, like in uh, threat detection. And it's going to store that data in that workspace. I can hook up Azure Sentinel to that workspace to ingest that data. So I can get um, machine learning based analytics and alerts on what's going on. And I can automatically execute uh, run books or um, processes to analyze the data and perform certain actions. Um, so if we look at the firewall itself, this is how most people would implement the firewall and then manage it. They go in here and they go, oh yeah, I want to have a look at threat intelligence. This is one of the features of the Azure Firewall, where it uses an intelligence database to analyze external IP addresses that may be sources or destinations of flows that are passing through the firewall. And we can turn it off. I will normally have it on alert only, or we can do alert and deny. So if the firewall sees a flow going to an external IP address and it thinks that external IP address is a source of malware, or if it sees a flow coming in from an external IP address and it thinks that's actually a known botnet, it will deny that flow. The problem with the deny feature is that a lot of the uh, entries that you see in these intelligence databases are false positives. They may have been right once. So for example, I see a lot of false positives about um, Ubuntu, for example, looking to download updates from a content delivery network in the US. And they're getting flagged as being potential sources of malware, that those IP addresses in the content delivery network. The problem is that CDN probably did share a website that once had malware on it, and now the threat intelligence databases are saying those IP addresses of the CDN are known sources of malware. Now, I'm getting legitimate content from the CDN. So do I want to deny that? I probably should alert on it, click save, and then if I'm clever, I will um, use Sentinel to say, right, if you find an alert on this, do uh, a, execute a, a run book or a task to inspect the, uh, the IP address, get information from one of these threat intelligence databases and from um, the internet, tell me about the IP address and the owner of the IP address, and then send that to a Teams team and let humans decide if it should be blocked or not. And then we can put a rule in the firewall to say block traffic to that IP address. We have the rules configuration. This is where you're going to spend most of your time. We have three categories of rules. We have NAT rule, network rule, and application rule. And they're broken into collections. A collection is a group of rules to have some relationship together. And they will either allow or deny traffic. So I've set up a simple one here called allow network rules. I can go into it. And in here, I can, can um, set up traffic or set up rules based on protocol and IP address. Simple enough. So pick your protocol, whether it's any ICMP, UDP, or TCP, and my port number as well. Um, which for some reason I'm not seeing in here. Um, and I can allow or deny that particular traffic. So simple enough process. Um, there we go, the destination port. And that will allow me to do traditional firewalling, simple enough. 
Um, we also have service tags, which are really useful. So if I want to allow traffic out to Azure services, I don't know, need to know the IP addresses of those services. I can use the service tags. So I can use the global service tags, or I can use the regional service tags. So I don't need to know those IP addresses to allow that traffic to actually uh, pass through. So that's our network rules. We have NAT rules. So if I want to do DNAT to allow traffic in and translate it to a different private IP address uh, and port number, I can do that without having to also do a network rule. It just is done implicitly. And we also have application rules. So what are these? Sometimes we have traffic that's going to a fully qualified domain name when we don't know what the IP address will be. In fact, the IP address may actually change over time. And we still want to allow that traffic. Some firewalls will force you to go down and figure out what those IP addresses are and change them over time. Azure says, well, if you know the fully qualified domain name and the protocol and port number, like HTTP 80 or HTTPS 443, or it may be a custom port number, yeah, go ahead. Let it go to management.azure.com or login.windowsonline.com or whatever it is. And you may be eagle eyed and notice it also supports MS SQL, so Microsoft SQL Server. So you can put in the fully qualified domain name of a SQL Server and say, oh, you want to allow traffic to that. So really cool, really useful. And I can go ahead and I can manage all of this using this UI and I can sit there and I can be quite happy doing that. But that's just one way of doing it. I personally am not a big fan of it because it means that stuff is being done without being logged, without being tested, without going through the proper change controls. You can put human processes around it, but humans can circumvent those processes. I'd rather lock down this environment and make it read-only so a human can't change this. A human has to go through a process to change the rules. And that process documents everything, logs everything, forces a human approval process, and allows you to do rollback as well. So if you're implementing processes like ITIL, ISO 27001, all of these good things, that sort of thing should sound good to you. So that's one way I can manage that firewall. That's one way of deploying the firewall. There's another way we can deploy the firewall that's in preview at the moment. And it's an amalgamation of two different technologies. It's taking Azure Virtual WAN, which is Microsoft's implementation of software-defined WAN, or SD-WAN which partners with companies like Citrix. Citrix were one of the first to partner with Azure Virtual WAN with their WAN scaler product and build an alternative to the to traditional MPLS WAN. In fact, if you're not even implementing a, a, a WAN, you can use the Azure Virtual WAN as an alternative form of virtual network gateway. And it offers lots of uh, cool things right now that the traditional virtual network gateway doesn't do. Plus, there's a huge amount of investment going into the Azure Virtual WAN, which I cannot talk about. Um, so it's a much better long-term solution than your traditional virtual network gateway, even for ExpressRoute or Cypress like VPN. Um, but this secure virtual hub is a new thing. Have a look. Let's go back to the dashboard. Here's my secure virtual hub, which is a, a, a fully featured hub for a hub and spoke architecture. And here's where I've built a virtual network with the firewall and the gateway and all the other bits and bobs, the traditional way. Look at the simplicity of this versus the old way of doing it with a virtual network. That's because this is what Microsoft referred to as a managed application. Microsoft have deployed all the pieces, but they've hidden them from us. We don't need to know about them. What they're doing is that they're giving us a simplified architecture, a simplified solution where we only have to manage configuration. We, want, we can manage the result. We don't need to know about all the other stuff. Under the covers, there is a virtual network here, but I can't see it. It's actually running in a Microsoft tenant. They manage that for me, just the same way as they manage stuff in the platform. When I'm running app services, there's virtual machines under the covers. When I'm running so-called serverless, there's actually servers under the covers. Don't be fooled, they're there. It's just you don't see them. So Microsoft have basically said, hey, we're going to push the virtual network down the stack as well with this solution. Now I only have to worry about the firewall and the virtual WAN appliance. Now how am I going to manage this? Well, I'm going to fire up Firewall Manager. Now you can use Firewall Manager, which is in preview, with the virtual network version of the Azure Firewall as well. However, that is in what's referred to as a managed preview. So only certain customers get support for that. Um, but I suspect we'll be seeing this coming fairly soon and um, because it's been in preview for quite a while. This solution, 
well, I've got my secured virtual hub and I can have multiple of these. So I can have one secure virtual hub per Azure region. Then all my spokes, all my virtual networks will connect to that. So if we go into this secure virtual hub and look at my connections, I can see I have multiple virtual networks that are peered with my hub. That's actually a very simple configuration to make that happen. If I go back out here and go to my virtual LAN, and I go to virtual network connections, I can add a connection, give it a name, pick my hub, pick the resource group that contains my spoke virtual network, and click OK. Under the covers, all the peering is done, and the peering is configured the way it needs to be configured to do the gateway sharing, the forwarding, the transit, all that good stuff that you would normally have to do in a hub and spoke architecture. It will all be done for me. If I go back into the firewall manager and go to my secure virtual hub, I can open up my hub, go to root settings, and this is where I will program out all the routing that I would normally have to do using root tables. So all that stuff is just being done for me and pushed out to the network using BGP. Really cool, really simplified versus the old way of doing things. Now that's not why I'm here. Why I want to talk about it, fire, Azure Firewall Manager is to talk about this, policies. Now if I'm doing secure virtual hub, I will have to use policies. If I'm doing the virtual network version of the Azure Firewall, I have the option of doing firewall policies. This is a whole new concept where we can say, right, instead of me editing the firewall to do the rules, I'm going to use these hierarchy of policies. So I can have a parent and I can have children. And you can see I've set up a pretty simple and well-labeled architecture. I have a global policy. This contains all the rules that I want to affect all of my firewall instances. And then I'm going to have a child policy, which will automatically take any rule changes from the parent policy or the global firewall policy, plus any rules I put in here, and automatically, immediately inject them into any associated hubs or firewalls. So any rule I put into global policy will affect all of the child uh, policies that are inheriting from it, and all of the firewalls are associated with those child policies. So what does this mean? Well, this means that I now rethink how I think about my firewalls. I don't think of them as individual appliances. I think of them as one virtual appliance across many Azure regions. And I configure all of my global firewall policy rules here. All of my rules where I say, right, everyone should be able to do an um, DNS lookups, or everyone should be able to uh, connect to uh, Microsoft's KMS, those sort of things. I can also put in rules in here to say, well, if you're trying to transit from one hub to another hub, I'm going to control that here in my global policy. And I can say what traffic will be able to get from one Azure region to another Azure region. But if I have stuff that's specific to an individual Azure region, like spoke to spoke traffic, I might control it using this particular policy here. And that allows me to really be clever about where I put these resources. And because they are actual resources, I can put them into different subscriptions or different resource groups and manage my ORBAC around those resources as well. So different people can have different roles and responsibilities and scopes of management within my environment. Um, that's a really cool technology. As I said, must be done with the uh, Secure Virtual Hub, but is an option with the regular firewall. That's really not what I want to show you. What I want to do is I want to go over to Azure DevOps. Now, I can also use GitHub for this as well. I just happen to use DevOps because that's what I'm used to working with. And um, while I'm no DevOps engineer, I use DevOps on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm a user of DevOps. Um, so I'm constantly in the backlog. I'm constantly doing stuff in the repos. I do uh, execute pipelines. Um, I'm not the person you talk to about engineering DevOps, but I'm a regular user of it. I'm a big advocate of it having been forced into it, uh, to be quite honest. So here I have something called a repository. This is a Git repository. And I can use the same Git client as I would with GitHub and um, to synchronize to it. And in here, in this repository, I have the files that make up my firewall. So I have a template. This is a template module that describes the deployment of my Azure firewall. There's a couple of, there's a bunch of parameters in here 
that take in inputs to customize the execution of this template. There's two of them I'm going to highlight here. Application rules collections, network rules collections. These are simple arrays that are injected into the part of the firewall resource, uh, which is down here, and will implement the uh, rules of the firewall. Very simple and very simple uh, deployment and configuration. What that basically does is it outsources the configuration of the rules to the parameters file. And here we can see the application rules collections. And here's a rule that allows traffic, has a priority of 100, and it's got a, um, a rule here for allowing um, traffic to app service environments based on FQDN tags that are in the application rules collection type and allowing management. And um, so traffic is allowed out on HTTP 80 and 443 to management.azure.com. I've got a network rules collection as well. So this is allowing traffic out for NTP, um, which is required for app service environment. So that's my repo. And I'm using um, the Git client to synchronize that to my PC. So if I go to my file explorer, go to this folder here, you can see there's a copy a synchronized copy of that repository or repo on my PC. And I've got it open using Visual Studio Code. You can see there are the files and there's the parameters file that I'm gonna be working with. This is sitting in a branch called master and I've locked that, that master branch uh, using a policy uh, on the master branch. That basically means that no one can make any changes to this directly. If they want to make changes, they've got to create a new branch, either here or in uh, VS Code, make the changes there, synchronize them up, and then issue a pull request to the owner of master saying, please pull my changes into master. And what will happen then? Well, there's a couple of things going on. If I go down to project settings, and I go down to service connections, I've set up some um, authentication. So I have basically said, hey, if you want to use DevOps to deploy a repository or uh, uh, the parameter file or the JSON modules and parameter files of a repository to an Azure subscription or to a management group in a Azure tenant, you can use some of these credentials. So I don't have to use user credentials and I don't have to store these credentials into uh, my repository, which is a really bad thing to do. And you should not hard code your credentials in there because your repository could fall into the wrong hands. Um, so they're stored here or uh, requested on demand, um, at least they're kept safe. So I have those credentials. And then if I go over here and I go to pipelines, I've created what's called a pipeline in GitHub. This would be called an action. I can, uh, I can edit this pipeline. And in here, we're gonna see a bunch of YAML. And most IT pros, when they hear YAML, they spine shivers a little bit, but it's actually pretty easy. You can, find, you can again, I've got this on my own blog on apenfin.com where you'll be able to copy this and deploy it. It's basically two parts of this pipeline, actually three parts. First is this thing called a trigger. This basically says, hey, if there is a change to the master branch, I want you to execute. And you're gonna execute on a Azure container image based on Windows Server 2019 with Visual Studio 2019. I don't even have to deploy that or supply that. I can supply my own custom container if I wish, uh, wish using Azure Container Registry, but I'm just gonna use one of the stock ones from DevOps. It's gonna perform two tasks. The first task is stage files. It's gonna grab the copy of my files in my repository and download them to a storage account. And there's the storage account and it's going to create a container in there that basically means hey all the files from that repository are now going to be available and they're going to be av made available securely using a sas token that sas token is now going to be used down here in the second task which is execute the json file so it's going to deploy do an azure resource group deployment or a json template deployment to a resource group it's going to execute my firewall.json with my firewall.parameters.json file. And this is where my rules are gonna be. So let's go back and 
there is all the past runs of my pipeline where I've been developing and testing this configuration. And I'm going to edit my rules. So what I'm going to do is go into a copy of my parameters file. And we'll just ignore those warnings. And I have created a whole new rules collection to support Windows Virtual Desktop. I thought that was kind of appropriate for E2EVC. So that is going to go into my application rules collection. So find the end of that rule and paste. There is my changes. But you know what? That's not going to work because I'm editing the master branch. That won't work. So what I've got to do on Visual Studio Code is create a new branch and I'm going to call it feature feature at WVD rules collection. Press enter. Now I'm editing a new branch of master and I'm going to add in my changes. Okay. That's my changes. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to commit these. So added W WVD rules. And the machine is thinking about it. Uh, cancel and sync. So now it's synchronizing my changes to the cloud. It's thinking about it. If it takes too long, I'll just do it directly in DevOps. We have five minutes left. There, it's done it. Now, if I go back to my repository in DevOps, I've now got a pull request available to me. So I can create this pull request. So I'm going to, as the firewall operator, I'm going to say, right, I've got my rules. I've submitted them to a branch called feature slash add WVD rules collection. I'm going to create a pull request. And I could put in some explanation about what's going on in my rules. And I can optionally add some people that I want to review um, this particular thing. If I know someone's on duty right now and they're available, they'll get pinged. I'll click create. Now, my job as the firewall admin is done. Now, one of my peers or a security officer will come along and say, right, I've now gotten a notification saying Aiden has submitted a pull request with some new firewall rules or some firewall configuration changes. I need to review those. So I will be brought to here with a link in an email. I can click files. I can have a look at the parameters file and I can scroll down. Where it's red means they've removed lines. Where it's green, they've added lines. And I can say, okay, I'm going to have a look at that. He's adding support for Windows Virtual Desktop. If he's doing JSON with comments, he might have put some comments in here as well. He's going to allow some stuff and he's allowing HTTP 80 and HTTPS 443 to these Microsoft addresses. That all looks good. I'm happy with that. I'm going to approve and I'm going to complete. Now, this complete is going to merge those changes into the master branch and remove the branch that Aiden created. So that's done. Now, what's going to happen? Now, the magic happens. We go over to pipelines and we refresh my view. Automatically, my pipeline has triggered because of that trigger I highlighted earlier. Any changes to the master branch, which has now just been merged, will execute the pipeline. So now there's a job running, which I can track. It will take a few seconds. So we're going to let that execute. It's now downloading the repository to the C drive of the Azure container image, and then it's going to execute the firewall deployment job. So we'll let that do that, and I'll quickly go back to the last couple of slides I have. Um, and so a last couple of slides. Um, so it's <laughs> literally last slide. Um, if this seemed like it was interesting for you and you think you could learn a lot more about Azure networking, um, there's way more to learn um, about implementing networking for security of IaaS and PaaS, for VM services, data services, app services, whatever it is. If you want to learn about micro segmentation, how to actually design that firewall. Putting the firewall in place, like I've talked about, is easy. The actual implementation of the networking to make traffic go through your firewall is a lot more complex. 
and I can teach you how to do that. Um, if you want to look at network design and have a look at the cool new stuff like uh, front door, even though it's not new, it's new to a lot of people, private link, private endpoint, which are brand new, Azure Sentinel, way more, and how all the man management monitoring tools fit together to give you a solution to not only secure your network, but also help you troubleshoot it. Um, then go to cloudmechanics.com or tinyurl.com slash July 30, 2020. Right, that's enough of that. Um, we will come back to our here. We see the Azure for Firewall job is actually deploying. So if I come into this resource group and go to deployments, I should see that the task is either executing still or it's actually finished. Um, yeah, the job has just finished. Now I can go to my overview, go into my firewall, go to my rules, and it was application rule collection. There is Windows Virtual Desktop, and there's my rule. Let's open that up, and we should see that there will be multiple FQDNs listed. And that's how we can do DevSecOps using the Azure Firewall.